In part one of this series, we looked at the famine itself and the immediate cover-up by the Soviet regime. But in this, part two, we will be looking at how foreign journalists and governments reacted to the famine, and how they used it for their own political gains. The communist philosophy that the end justifies the means has caused pain out of all proportion to the pitiful social progress communism's achieved. It has not hesitated to use force wherever possible to impose itself on unwilling people and to hold them in abject subjugation. Communist conspiracy is a deliberate and predictable plan of action to subvert the world. In the traditional motion picture story, the villains are usually defeated. The ending is a happy one. I can make no such promise for the picture you're about to watch. The story isn't over. You and the audience are part of the conflict. How we meet the communist challenge depends on you. Western journalists first began arriving in the Soviet Union after the February and October revolutions, covering it and the Russian Civil War in the aftermath of the Great War. Once the dust began to settle, access became more restricted to journalists. There had been censorship of the media during the Tsarist period, but the restrictions became more onerous. Most foreign correspondents were confined to reporting from within Moscow or Leningrad, and all they had to go on were official reports and propaganda from the Soviet Union. Some felt stifled under these restrictions, while others embraced them. A pair of British socialists, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, visited the Soviet Union numerous times throughout the 1930s. They had been founding members of the London School of Economics and the Fabian Society. They visited the USSR during the famine, and denied that any starvation was going on upon returning home. The two of them were believers in the cause, and chose to lie about the famine in order to protect the movement. The experience of the last three harvests seems to justify the claim of the Soviet Union that the initial difficulties of this giant transformation have been overcome. An American communist, Louis Fischer, was an ardent defender of Stalin, rejecting any notion of there being food shortages in the Soviet Union. In the Poltava, Vinnytsia, Podolsk, and Kiev regions, conditions will be hard. I think there is no starvation anywhere in Ukraine now. After all, they've just gathered in the harvest. But it was a bad harvest. And after the famine, he wrote, During all those hard years, the state endeavored to beautify life. The opera, the ballet, and many theaters displayed a dazzling richness of scene and costume incomparably greater than elsewhere in the world. Parks of culture and rest were established throughout the country to provide sensible recreation and civilized leisure. All governments are based on force. The question is only of the degree of force, who administers it, and for what purpose. 
force which eliminates oppressors and exploiters, creates work and prosperity, and guarantees progress and economic security will not be resented by the great masses of people. He was so deep into the Stalinist camp that in 1938, Leon Trotsky referred to him as a merchant of lies and the direct literary agent of Stalin. There were smaller famines happening right before the Holodomor, but the Soviets were eager to impress foreign celebrities who shared their political dreams. In 1931, the Irish playwright and fellow Fabian Society member, George Bernard Shaw, visited the Soviet Union, where he was welcomed as an honored guest among the party elites. While at a banquet in Moscow, George Bernard Shaw told a story about how his friends gave him large sums of canned food to take with him before visiting Russia, out of fear he wouldn't find any while there. In supreme confidence, he told the Soviet banqueters, They thought Russia was starving, but I threw all the food out the window in Poland before I reached the Soviet frontier. The audience was reported to have gasped at that revelation. That canned meat would have been worth a small fortune in the workers' paradise. And that was before the famine a year later. George Bernard Shaw was shown around to all the usual spots Soviets took celebrities for propaganda purposes, but there were some journalists who wanted to do their jobs. In 1932, a pair of Canadian women illegally drove across the Soviet Union until they were deported while in Tbilisi. One of these women, Rhea Kleiman, was a journalist who came to report on the Soviet reforms and saw the horrors of labor camps and eventually miles and miles of depopulated villages, emptied by the famine. Her stories are widely cited today by Western scholars talking about the famine, but in her own day her accounts were ignored, partly because she was a woman, but mostly because she wrote for a smaller newspaper of far less prestige. There were some publications in Germany that talked about the famine in the Soviet Union before it happened. A German politician and polymath, Otto Hoesch, visited the Soviet Union frequently throughout the 1920s and early 1930s, and he founded the scholarly journal Osteuropa, which still exists today. The journal began reporting on agricultural issues in the Soviet Union a year before the famine began, showing that Ukraine and the USSR was already in poor condition before the actual Holodomor began. Another tricky type of evidence for the Holodomor is visual. Pictures coming from out of Ukraine at this time are difficult to verify, and when some people have tried depicting the Holodomor, they'll use pictures from earlier famines in the 1920s, and the deniers will use this as a jumping off point to say that the entirety of the famine is a fabrication. But luckily there is at least one set of pictures that were undeniably from the Holodomor. An Austrian chemical engineer, Alexander Wienerberger, who was working in Kharkiv during the famine, managed to take 100 pictures that depict long lines of hungry people waiting at grocery stores, starving children, dead bodies lying on the side of the roads, and mass graves. He left the Soviet Union in 1934, and when he returned home to Austria, his pictures were published by the Patriotic Front in a book called Russia As It Really Is, and republished in 1935 as Should Russia Starve. France was probably the least informed on the issue of the famine. French communists defended the Soviet Union from claims of the famine in order to protect the fatherland of socialism. One French communist, Paul Valiant Cotier, who visited the Soviet Union numerous times, wrote this in 1932, regurgitating Soviet propaganda. It only went well since we were able to remove the kulaks. Here there was one of them that had been able to take control of the kolkhoz. By agreement with the former kulaks, he threatened people who did not enter the kolkhoz with enthusiasm. Comrade Stalin's letter arrived and we expelled the kulak. Then the kulaks set fire to the harvest, they killed the komsomol, we made them stop one night. Today almost everyone is a kolkhozian and works happily. Even ardent anti-communists didn't take up the story. They preferred to focus on Lenin's seizure of power, anti-religious persecutions, and later the Great Purges. They saw what little news of the famine reached them as failures of policy rather than a deliberate act of malice by Stalin. Stories were published in France, but only after the worst parts of the famine were already over, and those that did had very small circulations. One French writer wrote in Le Petit Messai, saying, this famine is due mainly to the will of the Soviets, who seek by this means to punish the Ukraine for their long national resistance. The history of Ukraine and the Red Terror which prevails there is one of the most lamentable of the post-war period. However, in October of 1933, a 54-page document was published in Brussels, titled Famine in Ukraine. It was intended for a French audience, and it had highly detailed maps about the varying levels of effect of famine across Ukraine. In it, it said, 
As the opponents in Ukraine are counted in millions, a general famine was necessary to subdue them. As the famine got worse, the restrictions placed on foreign correspondents became more onerous. Journalists needed to maintain good relations with the Soviet regime in order to remain in the country. Since the Soviet government controlled all telegraph lines, this meant that any story a journalist wanted to publish had to go through Soviet censors, and if they didn't like it, they would refuse to send it. A journalist could have a negative story about the Soviet Union hand-delivered to their newspaper through a courier or a diplomat, but as soon as the Soviets discovered who wrote the negative piece, that journalist would be deported and banned from ever entering the country again. Works under a sword of Damocles. The threat of expulsion from the country or of the refusal of permission to re-enter it. Officially, there was no famine. To anyone who lived in Russia in 1933 and who kept his eyes and ears open, the historicity of the famine is simply not in question. On top of this, the restrictions to leave Moscow became tighter, with all requests to visit Ukraine being rejected. We were summoned to the press department one by one and instructed not to venture out of Moscow without submitting a detailed itinerary and having it officially sanctioned. In effect, therefore, we were summarily deprived of the right of unhampered travel in the country to which we were accredited. Some brave journalists actually ventured out of Moscow, such as Malcolm Muggeridge, who wrote for the Manchester Guardian. It was the big story in all of our talks in Moscow. Everybody knew about it. There was no question about that. Anyone you were talking to knew that there was a terrible famine going on. Even in the Soviets' own pieces, there were somewhat disguised acknowledgments of the great difficulties there. The attacks on the kulaks, the admission that people were eating the seed grain and cattle. I realized that was the big story. I could see that all correspondents in Moscow were distorting it. Without making any kind of plans or asking for permission, I just went and got a ticket for Kiev and then went on to Rostov. Ukraine was starving, and you only had to venture out to smaller places to see derelict fields and abandoned villages. On a recent visit to the North Caucasus and Ukraine, I saw something of the battle that is going on between the government and their peasants. The battlefield was as desolate as in any war, and stretches wider. On one side, millions of peasants, starving, often their bodies swollen with lack of food. On the other, soldiers, members of the GPU, carrying out the instructions of the dictatorship of the proletariat. They had gone over the country like a swarm of locusts and taken away everything edible. They had shot and exiled thousands of peasants, sometimes whole villages. They had reduced some of the most fertile land in the world to a melancholy desert. Mugridge wrote a report on his trip and had it spirited out of the Soviet Union in a diplomatic bag. However, when the report reached the Manchester Guardian, the editors removed his critique of the Soviet Union due to political disagreements and it was published under a pseudonym so that Muggeridge wouldn't be deported. Probably the most famous story of a Western journalist risking their life to expose the truths of the famine was that of a Welsh journalist and his feud with the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist of the New York Times. Gareth Jones was a freelancer at the time he was hired as the foreign affairs advisor to former Prime Minister David Lloyd George. Thanks to these connections, he became the first foreign journalist to fly in a plane with Adolf Hitler where he interviewed him for an article in the Western Mail. Prior to the famine, he visited the Soviet Union twice and reported on the less than stellar situation in the countryside, reporting on the smaller 1931 to 1932 famine in Ukraine. He visited the Soviet Union for a third and final time in March of 1933 and visited Ukraine, only managing to do so by escaping his handler at a train stop and catching a ride on another train full of starving workers. He leaves the Soviet Union in late March and issues a press release in Berlin. Everywhere was the cry, there is no bread, we are dying. This cry came from every part of Russia, from the Volga, Siberia, White Russia, the North Caucasus, Central Asia. In the train, a communist denied to me that there was a famine. I flung a crust of bread, which I had been eating from my own supply into a spittoon. A peasant fellow passenger fished it out and ravenously ate it. I threw an orange peel into the spittoon, and the peasant again grabbed it and devoured it. The communists subsided. I stayed overnight in a village where there used to be 200 oxen, and where there are now six. Peasants were eating the cattle fodder and had only a month's supply left. They told me that many had already died of hunger. Two soldiers came to arrest a thief. They warned me against travel by night as there were too many starving, desperate men. We are waiting for death was my welcome. See, we still have our kettle fodder, go farther south. There, they have nothing. Many houses are empty of people already dead, they cried. 
His story would be picked up by more conservative outlets such as the New York Evening Post and the Chicago Daily News. But most journalists were either fellow travelers or sympathetic to the Soviet cause, and were hostile towards anyone who publicly published bad news about the Soviet Union. Gareth Jones became the first journalist to publicly call out the famine in the Soviet Union under his own name. Malcolm Muggeridge and the few others who had had done so under pseudonyms, and often their editors toned down the criticisms of the Soviets. On March 31st, the Pulitzer-winning New York Times journalist, Walter Durante, published a response to Jones. There appears from a British source a big scare story in the American press about famine in the Soviet Union, with thousands already dead and millions menaced by death and starvation. Its author is Gareth Jones, who recently spent three weeks in the Soviet Union and reached the conclusion that the country was on the verge of a terrific smash. It appeared that he had made a 40-mile walk through villages in the neighborhood of Kharkiv and found conditions sad. I suggested that was a rather inadequate cross-section of a big country, but nothing could shake his conviction of impending doom. To put it brutally, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. Jones responded to Durante's rebuttal. Censorship has turned them into masters of euphemism and understatement, hence they give famine the polite name of food shortage and starving to death is softened down to read as widespread mortality from diseases due to malnutrition. Not long after the Jones story broke, the Soviets arrested six British engineers working in Soviet factories, accusing them of espionage. It was suspected by Jones and numerous other journalists that this was done in response to the story in order to keep other journalists silent, not wanting to put the engineers in danger. So everyone else in the Moscow press corps joined with Durante in piling in on Jones. We all received urgent queries from our home offices on the subject, but the inquiries coincided with preparations underway for the trial of the British engineers. The need to remain on friendly terms with the censors, at least for the duration of the trial, was for all of us a compelling professional necessity. Throwing down Jones as unpleasant, a chore as fell any of us in years of juggling the facts to please dictatorial regimes, but throw him down we did, unanimously, and in almost identical formulas of equivocation. The scene in which the American press corps combined to repudiate Jones is fresh in my mind. Forced by competitive journalism to jockey for the inside track with officials, it would have been professional suicide to make an issue of the famine at this particular time. There was much bargaining in a spirit of gentlemanly give and take. A formula of denial was worked out. We admitted enough to soothe our consciences, but in roundabout phrases that damned Jones as a liar. Shortly after the Jones story broke, Lewis Fisher was asked about a story of a million people dying in Kazakhstan, to which he responded, Who counted them? How could anyone march through a country and count a million people? Of course people are hungry there. Desperately hungry. Russia is turning over from agriculture to industrialism. It's like a man going into business on small capital. However, when talking to an audience of college students in Oakland, California a week later, he said, There is no starvation in Russia. Walter Durante had been reporting from the Soviet Union since 1922, and had been awarded a Pulitzer in 1932. To the rest of the world, it was his word against the nobodies. Despite Durante being the prized writer of his time, his reputation has since deteriorated. Many of his contemporaries would later go on to talk about how he was a tool of the Soviets, feeding communist propaganda to the West through the trusted hands of the New York Times. Durante was the villain of the whole thing. It is difficult for me to see how it could have been otherwise, that in some sense he was not in the regime's power. He wrote things about the famine and the situation in Ukraine which were laughably wrong. There is no doubt whatever that the authorities could manipulate him. Eugene Lyons later recounted a dinner he had with Walter Durante. He gave us his fresh impressions in brutally frank terms, and they added up to a picture of ghastly horror. His estimate of the dead from famine was the most startling I had as yet heard from anyone. But Walter, you don't mean that literally, Mrs. Cormack explained. Hell, I don't. I'm being conservative, he replied. And as if by way of consolation, he added his famous truism, but they're only Russians. Once more that same evening, we heard Durante make the same estimate in answer to a question by Lawrence Stallings. 
When the issues of the Times carrying Durante's own articles reached me, I found that they failed to mention the large figures he had given freely and repeatedly to all of us. Durante communicated the reality of the famine to other journalists at the New York Times. A soon-to-be former fellow traveler, John Chamberlain, recounted his own story of hearing Walter Durante speak openly about the famine. To a group in the Times elevator, Durante had almost casually mentioned that three million people had died in Russia in what amounted to a man-made famine. Durante, who had floated the theory that revolutions were beyond moral judgment, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, did not condemn Stalin for the bloody elimination of the kulaks that had deprived the Russian countryside of necessary sustaining expertise. He just simply let the three million figure go at that. What struck me at the time was the double iniquity of Durante's performance. He was not only heartless about the famine, he had betrayed his calling as a journalist by failing to report it. Chamberlain mentioned the famine in his review of Escape from the Soviets, one of the earliest memoirs of a survivor or escapee from the gulags, which got him censured by American communists and Soviet sympathizers. These groups held so much sway at the New York Times that Chamberlain almost lost his job. It was only when another socialist who had heard Durante talk about the famine corroborated his story that he was saved. Louis Fischer would leave the Soviet Union during Stalin's purges, and gradually became disillusioned with communism, going on to contribute to the 1949 compendium, The God That Failed. Walter Durante was one of the most important figures in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's decision to grant diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union. After he was inaugurated, he requested a meeting with Durante to talk about the state of the Soviet Union. Durante also spoke with foreign diplomats stationed in Moscow, as well as the other European capitals, and in these conversations he spoke of the famine and about casualties nearing 10 million. Walter Durante was a Pulitzer winner, and do you know what he won his Pulitzer for? His reporting on the successes of farm collectivization during the first five-year plan. Durante knowingly lied about the exact thing he was reporting on. And thanks to the politics of the era, nobody believed anybody who contradicted him. Durante, never an idealist like Fisher, could not be disillusioned because he had no illusions in the first place. In later years, when Soviet philism had gone out of fashion, Durante lied about ever having lied in the first place. In his last book, published in 1949, he wrote, Whatever Stalin apologists might say, 1932 was a year of famine, and he claimed to have said so at the time. And, as we have seen, he had, but not in the dispatches to the New York Times. Durante wasn't the only liar in the Moscow press corps. Most of them collaborated with Soviet propagandists to one degree or another. But it wasn't just the Soviet censors they were trying to appease, but rather also the progressive elites back in their own countries. By 1934, faith in the Soviet experiment had become the intellectual fashion among the people for whose good opinion I cared most. It was clear to me what sort of account of Russia the intellectual elite preferred to hear. The editors of a liberal weekly invited me to a staff luncheon. I was given an opening to denounce books about Russia that had told too much. By stretching my conscience, I might have assured them that a new era of liberalism had dawned under the Soviets. But the Ukrainian famine, the Voluta horrors, the death decrees, and heresy hunts still smarted in my memory. I alluded to a few of these things. A chill seemed to come over the luncheon. Apparently I had committed the offense of puncturing noble illusions. The Olympian irony of the situation, I could not help thinking of it, was that these men, their exact kind, were being stamped out in the Soviet land like so many insects. They fitted perfectly into the category of pre-revolutionary intellectuals, who must hide in the dark cracks, praying for only one boon, not to be noticed. Other intellectuals were no less frightened of the truth. They asked questions about Russia and appeared horrified if I failed to give the prescribed answer. Indeed, it seemed to me that these men and women, insulted to the marrow by the inequities of bourgeois society, were wiping out the insult Japanese fashion by committing intellectual harakiri. The desire to belong, not to be a political dog in the manger, was a powerful inducement to silence, or at least to cautious understatement. But whatever happened to that one brave journalist, Gareth Jones, who slipped his Soviet handlers in order to explore the Ukrainian countryside, and document the horrors of the famine.
He returned home, published some articles on what he saw, but was largely ignored by the bigger progressive newspapers and the politicians. Like all journalists who published negative stories about the Soviet Union, he was banned from the country. So in late 1934, he decided to go on a tour of East Asia. He visited Japan where he interviewed numerous important generals and politicians. From there he went to Beijing and to Inner Mongolia, part of the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo. While there he was kidnapped by bandits, who demanded a ransom. Both Chinese and Japanese authorities tried to get in touch with the kidnappers, but to no avail. On August 8th, the kidnappers handed Jones over to another group, and on August 12th, 1935, the day before his 30th birthday, Jones was killed. Chinese authorities found his body on August 17th with three gunshot wounds. His former employer, Lloyd George, said this in response to Jones' death. That part of the world is a cauldron of conflicting intrigue, and one or another interest concerned probably knew that Mr. Gareth Jones knew too much of what was going on. He had a passion for finding out what was happening in foreign lands, wherever there was trouble, and in pursuit of his investigations he shrank from no risk. I had always been afraid that he would take one too many. Nothing escaped his observation, and he allowed no obstacle to turn him from his course, when he thought that there was some fact which he could obtain. He had the almost unfailing knack of getting at things that mattered. Mr. Jones, along with a German journalist, Herbert Mueller, traveled by car to Inner Mongolia. They were both kidnapped, but the bandits let Mueller go, supposedly to secure the ransom money. But the bandits had other ways of contacting authorities. Two days after letting Mueller go, they killed Jones. Why? Well, investigators would later find that the man who lent Mueller and Jones that car was an NKVD agent. There's also strong evidence that suggests that Mueller may have been one as well. Gareth Jones would die a largely discredited figure while Walter Durante would die with his reputation largely intact. With all the cover-ups by Western journalists and the Soviet regime, is it possible that the United States or other governments of Western Europe could have not known about the famine? No, they knew. They knew and chose not to do anything. They refused to listen to the advice of their journalists, spies, and ambassadors. Of all the governments in the world, the Polish government was the most aware of the ongoing famine and other failures of Soviet policy, because most refugees fleeing the Soviet Union did so through Poland, which had a sizable Ukrainian population along its eastern border. The Polish government treated Ukrainians as second-class citizens, placing many of the same restrictions on the Ukrainian language that the Russian Empire had. But they went a step even further and refused to call them Ukrainians, but instead Ruthenians. These restrictions resulted in numerous Ukrainian nationalist organizations to emerge, such as the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, which orchestrated assassinations and other acts of terrorism. When the Soviet Union signed the Non-Aggression Pact with Poland in 1931, both were on the same page when it came to the Ukrainian question. However, this didn't stop Polish diplomats from communicating atrocities committed by the Soviets to their own government, or to other diplomats across Europe. Mass arrests and persecutions cannot be explained or justified by peril on the part of the Ukrainian national movement. The real cause of the action lies in the planned, far-sighted, long-term policy of Moscow leaders who are more and more becoming imperialists, strengthening the political system and borders of the state. People outside of government service knew that there was a famine going on in the Soviet Union, and many of these professionals, such as economists, professors, and journalists, sent warnings to the U.S. State Department as early as 1931. Walter Durante himself told an American diplomat in Berlin. Durante pointed out that, quote, in agreement with the New York Times and the Soviet authorities, his official dispatches always reflect the official opinion of the Soviet regime and not his own. The New York Times never issued a disclaimer about this policy. Durante also told a British diplomat that there may have been as many as 10 million people dead from the famine in 1933. Since 1917, the United States had not granted diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union, and therefore didn't have any ambassadors or consuls in the USSR. 
However, the US did keep an eye on what was going on, especially in export markets, considering the main export of the Soviet Union was grain, which competed with the US by selling at below market values. More direct info about the Soviet Union was obtained through Polish or Latvian diplomats, who reported the Soviet land seizures, localized outbreaks of famine, and large numbers of refugees crossing into Romania and Poland to American diplomats in Riga and Warsaw. The U.S. legation in Riga sent this message to the State Department in July of 1932 based on reports from other diplomatic missions to the Soviet Union. At the beginning of the quarter, the agricultural situation was scarcely favorable. There was a general lack of agricultural products, which made itself felt in numerous difficulties with the food supply and with the supply of seed grain to certain districts. The situation in the Ukraine was particularly unfavorable, and if it had not been for successful sowing operations in some of the newer agricultural regions, the failure of the Ukraine would have presented the country with a very serious situation which was followed by another message in August. Taking into account the fact that grain production in Russia is still below pre-war and the fact that the country's population increases at the rate of 2% per annum, the decline of the grain area is a phenomenon the economic significance of which cannot be underrated. Despite the impression to the contrary created by the wording of the decree of May 6, 1932, the Grain Procurement Plan for 1932 embodied in the above-mentioned decree provides no relief to the peasants. In March of 1933, he sent this report to the newly inaugurated Roosevelt administration. The study of these developments over a period of several years leaves the indelible impression that the present condition of Russian agriculture is not the result of any criminal acts of a group of persons, but are the effects of the reaction of the peasantry as a whole, and in Russia that means the preponderant majority of the country's population, to a government policy which has deprived it of individual ownership and respect of most of its property, and which has robbed it of the incentive to work. Viewed in this light, the severe punishment which has been meted out to the 75 officials appears essentially as an act of terror undertaken with the double object of crushing criticism of Stalin's policy among government executives and concealing the true reasons of its failure by shifting the responsibility to quarters where it does not properly belong. The messages from diplomats continued through most of 1933, but in November of that year, President Roosevelt granted diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union. Why? In short, it was the Great Depression. After the stock market crashed in 1929, the conservative atmosphere vanished as governments tried all sorts of policies to jumpstart economic growth. And one of these was foreign trade. Not only was the US not openly trading with the Soviet Union at the time, but shortly after the US Senate passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, which hampered exports. At the same time, the Soviet Union was blasting its propaganda around the world through local communist parties boasting of how there was no depression in the USSR. Everyone who wanted a job had one. Free housing, free food, it was the workers' paradise. And a lot of people, especially among progressive elites and technocrats, believed them. The rest of the world could barely hold it together while the Soviets were on a spending spree. That was the image being presented to the world. Candidate and then later President Roosevelt not only wanted to open up trade with the Soviets, but he also believed he could get the Soviets to repay some of the debts owed to the US by the Tsarist regime. He was also interested in Soviet economic policy and possibly implementing it in the US, which is why he requested a meeting with Walter Duranty, who, after all, had won a Pulitzer for his reporting on the successes of the five-year plan. On top of this, Roosevelt was a progressive, and support for the Soviet system was the progressive norm at the time. Durante was only the most evident symptom of something far more pervasive, a climate of opinion which made telling the truth about Stalinism almost an offense against good taste in enlightened circles. American diplomats not only tried to warn President Roosevelt about the man-made famine in Ukraine, they tried to disabuse him of the notion that opening trade relations with the Soviet Union would lead to economic growth in the United States. Any talk that the USSR, where agriculture is ruined, where industry is on the verge of anarchy, and where the population is starving, will make enormous purchases in the United States is nothing else than Soviet propaganda. Not only was Roosevelt warned about the famine by experts in his government, but also by letters received from relatives of famine victims in the US. 
Dear Master of our country, President Roosevelt, I have a stepsister in Russia alone with four small children and starving, if we cannot help her a little. I have heard that you gave orders not to send money out of our country. Is it possible that I could get your permission to send an order for her to the American store out there not far from her hometown to get things to eat? It's not so easy to know you have sisters that's starving and you can't. Raise a hand to help, so I'm asking you to help if possible, so I can do what little I can and God will reward you for your kindness. I'm sure I will pray for your protection of your enemies. God alone can save you and no man on earth can stand before him. Closing with God's blessings to you and the missus, I thank you. Truly yours, Anna Whitkop. Ukrainian emigre communities in both the United States and Canada wrote letters to President Roosevelt trying to warn him about not opening relations with the Soviets and about the famine going on in Ukraine. Sometimes these letters would be delivered to high-ranking members of the Democratic Party, hoping that they could get it to President Roosevelt. But when they found out what these letters were about, they made sure that they never saw the light of day. Because if they did, it could politically damage President Roosevelt. After granting recognition to the Soviet Union on November 16th, numerous protests in both the US and Canada were held by Ukrainian emigres. One protest on November 18th saw 8,000 Ukrainians march in New York, who were harassed by 500 members of the local Communist Party, who stole pamphlets, spat at them, hurled racial epithets, and attempted to assault them. A similar instance was seen in Chicago a month later, which resulted in 100 recorded injuries. There can also be no doubt that both the State Department and the White House had access to plentiful and timely intelligence concerning the famine of 1932-33 in Ukraine and made a conscious decision not only to do nothing about it, but never to acknowledge it publicly. For political reasons largely related to FDR's determination to establish and maintain good relations with the USSR, the US government participated, albeit indirectly, in what is perhaps the single most successful denial of genocide in history. Despite the protests, President Roosevelt sent his first ambassador to the Soviet Union, William Bullitt. Bullitt, like Roosevelt, had high expectations for relations with the Soviets, but like all other diplomats sent to the USSR, he was quickly disillusioned. A nation ruled by fanatics who are ready to sacrifice themselves and everyone else for their religion of communism, neither Stalin nor any other leader of the Communist Party has deviated in the slightest from the determination to spread communism to the ends of the earth. Roosevelt replaced Bullitt with Joseph Davies in 1936, at whose insistence the administrator eliminated the Division of Eastern European Affairs, reduced the Russian Affairs section of the Riga Legation, and sent anti-Soviet diplomats into political exile in less important countries such as Turkey. Despite all of this, the Soviet ambassador, Alexander Troyanovsky, continued complaining that all American Foreign Service officers were reactionaries. On May 28, 1934, Congressman Hamilton Fish Jr. of New York introduced House Resolution 399. Resolved by the House of Representatives, the Senate concurring, the Congress hereby condemns the systematic disregard for human life and for human and national rights and liberties that characterizes the policy of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, expresses sympathy for the millions of victims of such policies, and urges the President to, one, proclaim a day for mournful commemoration of the great famine in the Ukraine during the year 1933, which constituted a deliberate and imperialistic policy of Moscow to destroy the intellectual elite and large segments of the population of the Ukraine, and thus enhance its totalitarian communist rule over the conquered Ukrainian nation. Two, urge the government of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics to remove current restrictions on the shipment of food parcels and other necessities to residents of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics by private individuals and charitable organizations. Three, issue a warning that continued subjugation of the Ukrainian nation as well as other non-Russian nations within the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics constitutes a threat to world peace and normal relationships among the peoples of Europe and the world at large, and concurrent resolutions October 5, 1984, four, 
manifest to the peoples of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics through an appropriate and official means the historic fact that the people of the United States share with them their aspirations to determine their own destiny and recover their freedom. The British government under Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald of the Labour Party also chose to do or say nothing about the famine, despite plentiful information coming in from diplomats, journalists, and other professionals. One of these professionals was Canadian agronomist Andrew Cairns, who traveled through Ukraine and the Northern Caucasus on behalf of the Empire Marketing Board in 1932. And in May of that year, he wrote a letter to the British ambassador in Moscow saying, like yourself, I have heard many stories about the serious food shortage in the rural districts. My friend, who is well informed on Russian conditions, just laughs when I ask him how present-day living conditions compare with pre-war and NEP times, and says there is no comparison. The day clerk at the Grand Hotel tells me that the collective farms around his home in the Ukraine have absolutely nothing and that there is a great deal of trouble there. Another British diplomat had this to say about the first five-year plan in 1932. The five-year plan proceeds on paper on its brilliant course, but viewed in cold light of reason, its achievements become less dazzling. Even the Soviet leaders have expressed themselves as dissatisfied with the results of 1931. The industrial development of the country is more theoretical than real. The great factories and works which have been erected have, for the most part, hitherto failed to justify their enormous cost both in money, moral, and health. The country is over-organized, and the machinery of the state apparatus clogged with bureaucracy, fear of responsibility, theory, and mismanagement. William String reported on the lack of food to the Foreign Office in August of 1932. Around the same time, Stalin implemented his law on socialist property, which made stealing of grain a capital offense, punishable by death. The Soviet press nowadays makes little serious attempt to disguise the fact that the more or less successful strivings to create a new polity, which are the sum and substance of the so-called plan, are accompanied and conditioned by a desperate struggle on the part of society for bare subsistence, which forms no part of the plan, and which is still believed the plan will one day resolve. Andrew Cairns wrote another report describing the desolation of the landscape as well as the lack of food that same month. All morning and forenoon, I saw the usual sight out of the train window, much fine land, idle, and growing only a magnificent crop of weeds, uncut crops full of weeds, and from the appearance of the stubble and stalks, the cut crops had apparently been full of weeds too. Voronezh, the capital of the central Black Earth area, looks even worse than many towns of similar size I have been in. The buildings and streets are all in a frightful state of dilapidation. To my surprise, there was very little bread for sale. The people in the streets looked even poorer than they usually do in most towns of similar size. And the number of rag-clad, pot-bellied children seemed to be as high, if not higher than usual. Walter Durante, who had been covering up the famine on behalf of the Soviets, spoke with William Strang in October of 1932 about the devastation of it, before Gareth Jones reported on it. Mr. Durante came today to exchange views. He has at last awakened to the agricultural situation. He says that the true position is only just being realized. His description of conditions was not very different from what we have ourselves been reporting for the last six to nine months. There has been a constant drain of population from the countryside since about 1929 due to a movement of peasants from country to town in search of better living conditions. It is a bitter experience for country workers to find their good produce dispatch they know not where and to be left with not even enough food to feed themselves. Large areas are almost depopulated and are going out of cultivation. In addition to all of this, the deportation of the Kulaks has swept the countryside of the most enterprising, skilled, and industrious part of its population. The ambassador who succeeded Strang, Sir Edmund Ove, reported to the British Foreign Office stories of food being taken from the homes of Ukrainians. A former British subject, now married to a Soviet citizen, stated recently in a letter regarding her desire to return to England that she had lately bought some flour on the open market 
but the representatives of the local agricultural authorities had entered the house and confiscated it without explanation. Another case, the holder of a British passport, who bought several pounds of flour, butter, sausage, and the open market for which she must have paid some hundreds of rubles at current prices. On her way home with her purchases, she was accosted by a party of men, describing themselves as representatives of a local village Soviet, who confiscated her property. In none of these cases do the persons concerned appear to have sought a remedy in the Soviet courts, but I hesitate to recommend them to do so. The French government was probably the least informed of the famine in all of Europe. Most of their information came either directly through Soviet propaganda or through their embassies outside of the Soviet Union. French journalists in Moscow didn't venture outside the city like their British and American counterparts. It also didn't help that France sent a former socialist prime minister, Edouard Herriot, as an ambassador to the Soviet Union. His Soviet handlers took him around several Potemkin villages, filled with well-fed people from the cities in order to disguise the famine. This tactic was already well known in diplomatic and journalistic circles, but Herriot absorbed the propaganda without the slightest critique. He later published a book denying the famine in 1933, The East where it savagely denies the reality of a famine in 1932 to 1933 in Ukraine. The Italians, in contrast, were far better informed about the goings-on in Ukraine. Unlike the French, British, or Americans, Italy had diplomatic consulates in Ukraine during the famine, and the Italian diplomats reported the devastation of the famine back to Rome. No bread of any kind is being sold on the open market anymore, not even the crust of bread. The lines of people waiting for bread distribution have grown interminable. You can see people standing for over 300 to 400 meters all along the sidewalk of a road, and you can find the store around the block of a parallel street. Beggars in the streets aren't interested in money anymore, as they can't get bread with the money, and it's bread they really want. The consul in Kharkiv reported this shortly before Stalin banned Ukrainians from traveling outside of Ukraine. Misery has generated real forms of banditry in Kharkiv and the surrounding area. Village newspapers reports of seven cases of infanticide resulting from the famine. It appears that we are undoubtedly dealing with cannibalism. It is not uncommon in the mornings to find at the marketplace the nude corpses of those murdered during the night. Some are exposed for many days along Kharkiv's frozen riverbed. More savage still is the way in which these outlaws treat children. More than 300 have disappeared in Kharkiv during the last six weeks. This number has been confirmed by numerous sources and there is no doubt about its validity. This tragic form of delinquency has diffused throughout Ukraine. In the courtyard next to the consulate, a child from a nearby village was found dead two weeks ago, nude and strangled. Shortly after Gareth Jones's trip to Ukraine, the Italian diplomats reported this. Riots recently occurred in Kharkiv in front of bakeries. In one of them, the suburbs, 3,500 people attacked the policemen who were trying to disperse them. In another suburb, two bakeries were attacked. Flour was taken and the premises destroyed before police could intervene. To prevent recurrence of such incidents, the police have resorted to the practice of mass arrests. One morning at 4 o'clock, the police suddenly blocked off the side street exits and surrounded a mass of 1,500 people gathered in front of a bakery waiting for it to open, trunching them to one of the courtyards at the nearby police station. When they were sent off to the station, loaded onto trains and driven back out towards the countryside. It is not uncommon for passengers who have died of starvation to be unloaded from their trains at stations. With the thaw, unburied bodies have been found out in the countryside in the villages. Whole families have withdrawn into their homes and are dying of a nation. Rumors are circulating of numerous cases of cannibalism. There were attempted international relief efforts, the most important of which was led by Cardinal Theodore Initzer of Vienna. He orchestrated an interfaith coalition of Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, and Jews to procure and distribute food to the inflicted parts of the Soviet Union, just as Herbert Hoover had done back in 1921. But unlike Lenin, Stalin wasn't willing to let any international relief ever come in. Doing so would not just be acknowledgement of the Five Years Plan's failure, but he feared that it would secretly be funding an armed uprising of Ukrainians against Moscow. Initzer wanted to do more, but the sitting Pope, Pius XI, wanted to avoid getting the church entangled with politics, which would violate the agreement made between the Vatican and Mussolini. He also feared that openly condemning what the Soviet Union was doing would lead to world leaders accusing the Catholic Church of supporting the Nazis and fascists, so he remained silent. The Germans also had consuls in Ukraine, and so were privy to what the Italians saw as well. The communist rulers do not let the peasants remember their hardships for too long. 
Achieving this by having one hardship follow the other immediately and thus, whether one wants to or not, the old fears are forgotten. In the past, if someone in a village was struck by misfortune, entire generations remembered. Prior to Hitler's ascension to power, the German diplomatic missions in the Soviet Union felt strongly about the famine in Ukraine. The German consul in Kiev saw a Soviet newspaper claim that there was a famine going on in Germany. In response, the consul's wife goes out to the countryside and takes photos of corpses along the roads. Meanwhile, in the Moscow embassy, younger German workers petition their government to cut ties with the Soviet Union. But the government refuses, not wanting to shut off trade during a depression. The German diplomat in Moscow and future advisor on Soviet policy to the CIA, Gustav Hilger, stated this about the famine. It was our impression that the authorities deliberately refrained from aiding the stricken population, except those organized in collective farms, in order to demonstrate to the recalcitrant peasant that death by starvation was the only alternative to collectivization. The German government was acutely aware of the goings-on in the Soviet Union, especially because a sizable number of Germans lived in the Volga region, which was also hit by the famine. The Volga Germans sent letters to their relatives in Germany and the US, some of them being published in newspapers. Hitler would speak about the plight of the famine among the Volga Germans, but not of the Ukrainians. But for the most part, Hitler's government was silent on the famine, not wanting to antagonize the Soviets too soon. The Nazis would later publish a collection of eyewitness testimonies from Volga Germans titled, And So You See the Soviets in a True Light. These testimonies themselves were accurate, but the commentaries around them were Nazi propaganda, which blamed the Jews more than the communists for the actual famine. But the story of the famine does not end here. For the quest for utopia brings yet more sorrow. To paraphrase an idiom popularized by Karl Marx, First it came as tragedy, then later as farce. After several years of antagonism, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany signed a non-aggression pact, in which they divided Eastern Europe between the two of them, and promised to stay out of each other's way. And they would celebrate this by dividing up Poland. Poland was on edge and anticipating an attack from Germany, and when it came on September 1st, 1939, the continent quickly submerged into war. Britain and France, keeping up their public vibrato, declared war on Germany on September 3rd. The Soviets expected the Poles to hold up better than they had, but the speed of German advances forced them to declare war on September 17th. They annexed the territories of Eastern Poland, and in a gift to the Ukraine, they merged the Ukrainian portions of Eastern Poland with the Ukrainian SSR. In November, the Soviets invaded Finland and annexed northern Bukovina and southern Bessarabia, also adding them to the Ukrainian SSR. And in June of 1940, they invaded and occupied the Baltic states. The annexations and occupations resulted in violent deportation of class enemies and replaced all private industry with Soviet commissars. But the Soviets wouldn't have long to enjoy their ill-gotten gains. On Sunday, June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany declared war by invading the Soviet Union. Stalin was initially unresponsive to the attack, but he did start making plans to resist the invasion. On June 27th, he issued his secret Scorched Earth Order. All valuable materials, energy, and agricultural stocks, and standing grain that cannot be taken away and can be used by the enemy must, in order to prevent such use, upon order of the military councils of the fronts, be immediately made completely worthless, that is, must be destroyed, annihilated, and burned. Along with this, he ordered the creation of sabotage groups to stay behind, wreck farm equipment, and harass the Germans. The orders were only supposed to be applied to regions near the front, but some local Communist Party leaders away from the front began destroying their own crops and farm equipment out of fear of waiting too long. Along with the destruction of socialist property, NKGB agents were sent to prisons along the front, which were holding mostly political prisoners, and had them killed. In some towns and villages, the executions were interrupted by locals coming in to warn the agents that Germans were on the outskirts of towns, causing them to flee before finishing the task. But oftentimes, the Germans were still, in reality, miles away. In Ukraine, some local parties encouraged the dismantling of the collective farms and the return of tools, land, and livestock to their previous owners. 
Sometimes the collective farm workers would do this spontaneously on their own after hearing about another village nearby doing so, and often against the will of the local party. The Germans would often come across a perfectly intact wheat field, but the tractors were missing parts. The only places in Ukraine and across much of the Eastern Front that fully implemented the Scorched Earth Order was along the main roads the Red Army was retreating on. As the Nazis invaded the USSR, numerous peoples treated them as liberators, such as the peoples of the Baltic states and especially the Ukrainians. Entire units of Ukrainian soldiers deserted the Red Army in support of the Germans. There were some within the Nazi government who believed the entirety of Soviet society could have been turned against Stalin, such as Hans Kolk, an intelligence officer on the Eastern Front. The vast majority of the population of the Ukraine has turned out to be anti-Bolshevik. Almost all of them consider their political future to be on the side of the Axis powers, and first of all the Greater German Reich. In countless gatherings, people speak spontaneously of Adolf Hitler, our greatest leader and liberator. Mothers instruct their children to address the German soldiers as uncle. Every day, peasant men and women lay fresh flowers on the graves of German soldiers on their own initiative. This feeling was especially true of veterans from the First World War, and others old enough to remember the German occupation and how they defended them from the early Bolshevik attacks under Lenin. The Germans announced the creation of a new Ukrainian state, which brought many Ukrainians to their side at first. Some formed their own military units in support of the Nazi occupiers. The Nazis would airdrop leaflets over territories they were about to occupy, announcing the changes they were going to make. Some locals engaged in looting as the Germans arrived or as the Red Army left, all the while the NKVD burned government records. A majority of Ukraine was occupied by November of 1941, and over half a million Red Army soldiers had been captured. Hungarian and Romanian troops serving in occupied Ukraine had a habit of stealing from the local populace, with the Germans participating at a lower scale. Most civilian deaths at the beginning were from soldiers suspecting the local was a partisan or saboteur, but as the war went on, especially behind the front lines, most of them were done out of convenience. Now I'm sure some of you are wondering, how could the Ukrainians collaborate with the Nazis? I mean, after all, they're Nazis. But take this into account, none of this was new to the Ukrainians. Two years earlier, the Soviets had collaborated with the Nazis in order to invade sovereign countries and everything the Nazis were doing to the Ukrainians had already been done to them by the Soviets, and in some cases, worse by the Soviets. So, from the perspective of someone who's already been through hell, what's the harm in taking another trip? After all, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Almost all of the peasants supported without hesitation what they assumed was a war only on Stalin and his regime. In the Soviet Union, we found on our arrival a population weary of Bolshevism which waited longingly for new slogans, holding out the prospect of a better future for them. It was Germany's duty to find such slogans, but they remained unuttered. The population greeted us with joy as liberators and placed themselves at our disposal. The Germans had plans for Eastern Europe. Russian Poland would become a German protectorate called Ostland, Ukraine would become an independent state in alliance with Germany, the Baltics and Belarus would become protectorates until they could be annexed, and Caucasia would become a German plenipotentiary. But most of these states weren't supposed to be populated by its native inhabitants. They were supposed to be replaced by ethnic Germans moving in, all the while working the local inhabitants to death. After all, these people were Slavs, just one rung above Jews in their eyes. Hitler and the Nazis wanted Ukraine for the same reason the Soviets did, and they had a plan. Herbert Beck was a Nazi official in charge of food and agriculture, and he developed the Hunger Plan, which was to work the Slavs of Eastern Europe to death out in the grain fields, so they could feed the Nazi war machine. There was enough food around to potentially save thousands of Russian prisoners of war, and it was a racist ethos, not economic constraints or other circumstances, that enabled their captors to embark on their deliberate starvation. The job of feeding the German people stands at the top of the list of Germany's claims on the East. The southern territories will have to serve for feeding of the German people. We see absolutely no reason for any obligation on our part to feed also the Russian people with the products of that surplus territory. We know that this is a harsh necessity bare of any feelings. The future will hold very hard years in store for the Russians. The German administration in these territories may well attempt to mitigate the consequences of the famine, which undoubtedly will take place 
and to accelerate the return to primitive agricultural conditions. However, these measures will not avert famine. Any attempt to save the population there from death by starvation by importing surpluses from the black soil zone would be at the expense of supplies to Europe. It would reduce Germany's staying power in the war and would undermine Germany and Europe's power to resist the blockade. This just be clearly and absolutely understood. The Slavs are to work for us. Insofar as we don't need them, they may die. Therefore, compulsory vaccination on German health services are superfluous. The fertility of the Slavs is undesirable. They may use contraceptives or practice abortions, the more the better. Education is dangerous. It is enough if they can count up to 100. Every educated person is a future enemy. Religion, we leave to them as a means of diversion. As for food, they won't get any more than is absolutely necessary. We are the masters, and we come first. Despite all the promises the Nazis made to the Ukrainians, none of them were kept. Most pressing of which being that around farm collectivization. Many farms had been decollectivized during the invasion, but as the occupation began, the Germans not only banned further decollectivization, they recollectivized many farms as well. The Nazis wanted Ukraine and the rest of Eastern Europe for Lebensraum, and the big reason for Lebensraum was food. When farms are collectivized, it's a lot easier to appropriate the grain. They also followed the Soviet example by taking food from people's homes, so the Germans continued most of the same policies as the Soviets. The only difference being they allowed some churches to reopen, so long as the churches didn't foment any resistance. The Germans also waged a propaganda war in the Ukraine, trying to win their minds, all the while starving their bodies. They continued distributing leaflets, telling the Ukrainians they would decollectivize the farms as soon as the communists were taken care of. They uncovered mass graves of victims killed by the Soviet secret police, which were plastered in newspapers to support Nazi propaganda. The biggest difference, though, was that people were allowed to talk about the famine in public for the first time. The first semi-academic articles about the famines were written by Ukrainian demographers during the Nazi occupation. Many of these articles had to go through Nazi approval, consisting of enough anti-Semitic propaganda, but the Ukrainians were desperate to read anything that hadn't gone through Stalin's censors. Public gatherings occurred where people shared their stories about the famine, with some people even confessing to cannibalism, but the crowds forgave them, knowing the hell that the communists had put them through. Eventually, the Nazis were driven out of Ukraine and the Soviet Union, and with that, any talk of the famine ceased. Many Ukrainians were executed or sent off to the gulags for having collaborated with the Nazis, and it was after the war that the Soviets developed their new propaganda techniques. Before the war, opponents of the Soviet Union were referred to as reactionaries or as the follower of one or another defunct political factions from during the Civil War. But afterwards, everyone who opposed the Soviet Union in any way was referred to as a fascist, a Nazi, or a Hitlerite. This tactic was developed by Soviet propagandists, and it spread like wildfire across the political left around the world. Also in the post-war years was the creation of international institutions such as the United Nations, which was tasked with dealing with the crimes of the Nazis, including the Holocaust, which was a seemingly unprecedented massacre of human life. During the war, a new word gained popularity, genocide, a combination of the Greek word genos, meaning race, and the Latin suffix side. The word was coined by a Polish-Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin. He initially coined the word to describe the mass murder of Armenians in World War I, but as news of what the Germans were doing to Jews in camps across Europe became known, the usage of the word began to focus on the Holocaust. He originally defined genocide in his book, Axis Rule, in 1944, which included trying to destroy groups based on nationality, ethnicity, culture, religion, and politics. This definition was problematic for the Soviets. The famine against the Ukrainians wasn't because of their nationality, ethnicity, or culture. Stalin didn't particularly care that the Ukrainians spoke their own language. He only cared when what was being spoken in that language was politically against his interests. The Holodomor was a genocide against the Ukrainian national movement, against anyone who wanted some kind of political independence for the Ukrainians. It wasn't intended to wipe out the Ukrainian ethnicity or nationality, but rather to eliminate a political threat. 
Because if the Ukrainians were allowed to leave the Soviet Union, who else might try next? According to Lemkin's definition, the Holodomor was in fact a genocide. But you don't have to take my word for it. Lemkin said so himself. In a speech he gave in New York in 1953, he described the famine as, Perhaps the classic example of Soviet genocide, its longest and broadest experiments in Russification, the destruction of the Ukrainian nation. A famine was necessary for the Soviets, and so they got one to order. This is not simply a case of mass murder. It is a case of genocide, of destruction. Lemkin tried to get a treaty on the genocide passed in 1945, but it failed. He spent the next several years until the UN hosted its own convention on genocide in 1948. An early draft of the treaty condemned genocide on religious, racial, political, and any other ground. But the Soviets resisted the inclusion of political groups. The Soviet representatives said, They were entirely out of place in a scientific definition of genocide, and their inclusion would weaken the convention and hinder the fight against genocide. This played into the Soviets' new post-war propaganda plans. They wanted the idea of genocide to be an exclusive sin of fascists and Nazis. In order to get the Soviets to sign up on the treaty, the reference to political groups was removed, and done so with the approval of Raphael Lemkin. Had the concept of genocide remained simply an idea in the minds and writings of scholars, there would be no argument today. According to Lemkin's definition, the Holodomor was a genocide, as it is by most intuitive understandings of the word. But the concept of genocide became part of international law in a completely different context, that of the Nuremberg trials and the legal debates which followed. At this point now, the Ukrainians have had farce heaped upon tragedy heaped upon farce upon more tragedy. But now, from this point, their lowest point, they will finally begin to claw their way out of the darkness and finally get the world to see the crimes committed against them by the workers' paradise, regardless of your own political narrative.